All right, I want to uh, welcome you all here and uh, to those of you joining us on the web for our conversation with uh, Angelique Kijo. I, I will tell you, I was just um, uh, a little while ago with, uh, with Tony Blair having an interview with him, and later on I'll be with the uh, head of the World Bank, Jim Young Kim, and I'm, I, for all of these other things, I'm dressed quite appropriately, but I feel like a tool right now. <laughs> uh, uh, but they did say it's fireside chat style, right? So at least I'm not, I didn't change into my presentation shoes. These are the shoes I would wear if I'm sitting with a friend here. It's okay. Uh, so that's, that's why we're here. I like the way you look anyway. Thank you, thank you so You're much. You're sharp, I like it. Uh, I like are, elegant men. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we are going to have a fantastic conversation with all of you, uh, but uh, before I do that, you are a recipient of the of the Crystal Award here at the World Economic Forum, and by, by, by because of some mishap on the plane that you were coming in, and I'm glad it was a small one, you, you weren't able to get in for the ceremony. And you'll tell us the story momentarily about that, but I want to invite Hilda Schwab uh, up here to present the award that uh, you were going to get the other Yes, night. finally, I can have it! <laughs> Yay! Wow! So, let me say just a few words that you are really the happy crowd who can see her close up and not far away on the stage. stage so I'm very happy uh, to present this award to Angelique Kijo for being an outstanding artist, but also for being concerned and committed to doing things for humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. So um, I want to dedicate this um, award to uh, the women of my continent. They are the backbone of Africa. Every day, there's no day that goes by without them doing something to make the life of the children, their family, their community, and the country better. I cannot be who I am today without those women. For starting from my mother, my grandmothers, my father is my champion. I think my father have, have saved manhood for all of you guys. <laughs> because he was the man that loved women completely, supporting my mom in her endeavor, and us girls always urging us, learn, go to school to be able to be in charge of your future. And to all the women of the world, what you do is priceless. We are not recognized for what we do. It's not a matter of color. It's not a matter of language. It's not a matter of nationality. We just have to come together and create a society of women that will deal with the problem of the world with men that love women and support women in every shape or form because we need them on our side to be able to break the glass ceiling, to be able to raise our kids, boys and girls, decently and create a world of peace and love. Thank you so much Thank for you. this award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we can put it right here. Let's, let's display it through the course of the, uh, the, the time that we are here. Uh, so many things that we, we want to cover in the next hour. I was at an event last night. Tina Brown had an event uh, with women, and it was uh, remarkable. Sister Rosemary from Uganda was there. She was one of the recipients. Uh, and it, there were a smattering of men in the hall. I think some because we had to serve the food. Um, but, but she said... <laughs> At least the, you're useful for something. The, right. The, but the men who were invited, she said, the men who are here are the ones who uh, will support women who will understand that, that this is what the, the job we have to do. We've for too long controlled everything. Uh, let's, let's show that we can support uh, the women around us who are, who are strong and capable. And you are so much of that. But let's go right back. I, um, I like you, I'm a child of Africa. I was born in, in Nairobi uh, because my parents had to leave South Africa mm -hmm. because they were anti-apartheid activists. But I grew up with the sounds of Miriam Makeba, as did you. And she was an influence, a musical influence for Absolutely. you. What did she represent to you? Well, when I start listening to music that come from around the world, apart from the traditional music in which I grew up in, uh, my brother decided to have a musical band, and my father bought the instrument for them. But they were cover band. They would play Jimi Hendrix, James Brown, um, uh, Jackson 5, all the music that was there, the Rolling Stone, the Beatles, everything was home. It was a kind of collect collection of music that was eclectic, yet very interesting for me. So that's the first time I was encountered with the language English, because Benin is a French-speaking country, where I hear different languages. And on the cover of the albums, all I can see was men, white male, black male, and some few African-American male, we, female. And I'm like, in my little herd of girls, I'm like, if you're an African girl, can you have any album? Can you have any career? 
Can you do any of these, or just you can? You're just talking, doing the traditional. There, music. there were not many examples. There are not many examples. And here comes um, the album of Miriam Makeba, the album Pata Pata with a bare shoulder with that golden mm -hmm. uh, hat that she had on. And one of the songs that w that made it out to the world very early. It wasn't it, just an African no, song. No, and it's just like crazy. And I was like, who's this? And they say she's from South Africa. And I'm like, huh? An African woman? that is on the cover of an album and doing it internationally, I don't want to be her. <laughs> if she can do it, so can I. That's where it started. And I was fortunate enough to have met Miriam. Um, I opened for her in 1989 at the Olympia Hall in Paris. And I always refused to explain South Africa during apartheid. And after apartheid, I was invited in 1996 to play there. And I told her I was coming, she was already there. So I called her and then she said, come home, my child, come. With that sweet and lovely voice, Come home, I thought, okay, we got, and I arrived there for lunch, and I look at the table. She cooked a storm. I'm not like, ma'am, you think I'm gonna eat all this? She raised my, my wrist and go, you're too skinny, you're gonna eat. <laughs> We're gonna pay you, you're gonna have dinner all the way to 10 p.m. I'm like, I'm gonna eat from noon to 10 p.m.? She said, yes. You take a break and you eat. And she's a great cook. And one of the first things she taught me is, never go on stage with a watch. Huh. And I said, why? And then she said, when you have a watch on your wrist, the temptation to look at the clock is greater than if you don't have any. That being on stage and doing this means you're sending a message to your public saying you're getting bored and it's about time to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay. And since then, I never wear a watch on stage, ever. Uh, music to you is, is transporting and it's, it's universal. And I want to get to that in a second. But when you just received the award, you spoke of your father. Both your mother and your father, remarkable influence in your life. But tell me why your father is such an influence in you being a strong woman. Well, my father was the only child boy of a mom, of his mom. And he didn't know his father. He was, his father was gone before he was born. And my grandmother had never been to school, doesn't know how to read or write, but was determined that my father was going to go to school. And my father traveled out of the country to go to school because at that time, French government was sending people that was succeeding in school to go over, uh, overseas to become the one that worked in the, the, the administration. And my father became the second to, uh, to run the post office when we start post office in Benin. And when he married my mom, my mom also had been to school. So both of them were already huge advocate of education. Mm. And I'm realizing the scope of the impact that my father had in my life once I left. And I become adult enough to understand what sacrifices they went through to send 10 children to school with one salary. Book, uniform, tutoring, everything needed. Mm -hmm. And my mom has passion for theater. So one day she decided that she was going to have a theater group. No support from nobody. She wrote the piece, did the costume, the mask, everything, the lightning also. My mom was like a maestro of the theater. And I was six years old and I would see everybody coming in, see the costume, it was dancing, singing, and I would know, I would learn every part. And the dancing and the singing part. And from the moment my mom started touring with that troupe, Two seconds after she left home, people start coming to my father and saying, Frank, who's wearing the pants in your house? And my father goes, what do you mean? Are you going to let your wife go with all those people around? Who's going to cook for you? Who's going to take care of you? You should tell her not to do that. And I wrote a song based on the phrase of my, my, that response of my father. The song is called Lolo Ye, my daughter sang on it. My father said specifically this, when you love somebody, you have to set the person free. Love is not, a, is not a jet cell. If my wife is happy, I'm the most fortunate and the most richest person on the planet. So if you don't mind, you can leave. Hmm. Interesting. You, um, 
in and amongst all of this traveling in these troops and these rehearsals that your mother would have as a choreographer, you were learning languages. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in Canada where they're still fighting about French versus English. Meanwhile, all these, <laughs> all these immigrants speaking all these other languages have come in. Uh, and in America, you still go places where there are shopkeepers that say English only. Uh, in, in, in Africa, uh, it's quite typical for people to speak more than one language. If you want to get yourself understood, yeah. Yeah, and, and so you speak in four and you sing in five. Tell me what they are and why there's one more that I you sing in. I sing more than in five languages. I sing in French, I sing in English, I sing in Portuguese, I sing sometimes in Spanish, I sing in Fon, I sing in Mina, I sing in Yoruba, and I sing in Gun. Wow. And sometimes I sing Zulu. Wow. The closer I can't do like, I was one gonna I can't. say. I was gonna say I could understand every all of those I, until the end of the Zulu. Every time I have to do that, I ask the South African back in singing, I say, you pick that part up and I do the other one. <laughs> it's too complicated. And the reason I ask you about the languages <laughs> is because you, you've sort of uh, created your own language. You, you, I do. You have this language. Tell me about this. Well, there's one thing that I, um, I learned. Um, one day I was in the village of my father and there was a ceremony and people were singing and dancing and we were just doing it. And then suddenly I stopped paying attention to the world. I'm like, Ooh, this is gruesome, and everybody's dancing, what is that? So I had an uncle, and every time he saw me come in, my nickname in my family, in my village, when, why, how? I ask so much question, and before I come, they say, this is the deal, you have no question. I say, yes, yes, and I sit down and start asking questions. <laughs> because you don't ask, you don't know, right? Right, right. So I went to my uncle, I said, Uncle Kusanuko, what is that? The, the lyrics is so horrible, and people are dancing on it. And he set me aside and said, as an artist, what you want to achieve? You want to lecture people? You want to make them feel guilty or you want to empower them? I say empower, of course. He said, that's your role. Use the music, let them dance on it. The message is heavy. Let them make the decision what they're going to do about that message. It's not your job to make people feel guilty when you're on stage. It's your job to empower them. Bring the problems that you want to talk about Bring it in a way that it doesn't put a weight on people's shoulder, but lift them up to say, we can tackle and we can, we can do something about it. That's what it is about. And then I go about it and say, okay, I understand that. But how do you write a song? How do you know a song is a good song? He said, I wish I had the answer for you. But one thing I know that I can tell you right now is that it's, the song is made of three things. The melody, the rhythm, and the language. When you, once you start being inspired, you see those differently. But once you put your inspiration and you don't distract from it, you don't try to make it sound too poppy, you don't want to make it, you leave the truth of that inspiration out. You yourself, once the song is completed, you cannot say which one come first, which one comes second, which one come third? Because it's just it's blended into it the whole. It blended one and become one sound. Yeah. So for me, when I'm inspired and a word comes to me and I don't understand what it is, I don't take that word out. I don't. Right. I mean, I wrote a song called Wombo Lombo. I mean, that Wombo Lombo word comes to me because the inspiration was what you can do with your body when you're a dancer. A dancer is also a kind of musician because the way you move, the way you have a, a, a choreography set up, you have the verse, the chorus and the bridge in the way you dance. You cannot dance the same type of movement all the time because your body, you just put too much stress on some part of your body. So, Wombolo Po for Wimi Me was represented the wave of a, a dancer that I've seen dancing and you wonder if the person have a bone because every move is just so smooth and the way he learned, the way he lift himself up, the way he just take the space. For me, it was Wombolo just like wombly like this. Like a kid would invent a word. Exactly. And, and I invent Batonga too. Yeah. I invented Which is the name of your foundation. Yes. It's the name of my foundation because when I was in secondary school, first of all, when I started singing, I was very young. And when I hit puberty kick, kicking at around 12, I have people following me after school who spit at me, throw stone and stand at me, calling me prostitute because I was a singer. And uh, my grandma have taught me after that that I just have to decide for me what is good for me. Don't let people tell you what you gotta do. And when you, I, the secondary school started, you have the bullies everywhere you have bullies. 
And I remember two big giant guys when I come in the first year of uh, high school. And they said to me, come and clean my feet. I look at them and say, you clean yourself. They say, you do it or be, I say, you try to beat me. Come on. I got brothers. I have seven brothers. You want to run? <laughs> <laughs> and as soon as I say they say, oh, and they walk away. But it doesn't stop there. Some of them manage to have the kind of wooden uh, um, um, uh, pole, and they'll put mirror. Mm -hmm. They'll break mirror in pieces, and they'll tie it on it, and they'll try to see under your skirt if, how, what color is your underwear. And it's just all those things, and they're just like, and I'll come back home telling my father, I'm angry, I want to slap somebody. And my father always used to say to me, physical fight, you already lose the battle. Use your brain, it's your ultimate weapon. Beat those stupid guys. Tell them something, they think they know all about it. Just find something, come up with a word, or something that you will throw at them and they will try to, while well, they're bringing their mind around it to understand, you're already gone. So I'm like, well, okay. And we have a free girlfriend, we bike to school, one big one, one smaller one, somebody smaller than me, can you imagine? <laughs> it exists. So, so on the way, and then when I would get home to school and then I would start hearing all those comments, look at this one, from, Oh, yappy, yappy. And I go back to and they go, huh? What did you just say? I'm, all, I'm like, whoa, I'm out. And it means to me, for it, it was my mantra. It means to me, I will be whoever I decide to be. I will do whatever I want to do. It, it's none of your business, and you can't stop me. Batonga. Batonga. We should all use that word. That's it. <laughs> Don't let anybody get into your space. Tell them, Batonga. I'm going to try that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about your brothers who would do this cover music, uh, uh, James Brown and uh, Jimi Hendrix. Th that influenced you as well. You seem, to, you seem to be somebody who grabs influences from anything you see and like. Well, that's what the traditional music is about. Yeah. That's what the traditional musician told me. If the music doesn't evolve, it doesn't exist. Right. Traditional mu music has to follow modernity because my ancestor, five uh, uh, centuries ago, the song that they were singing was their reality. Today is a different reality. So you can just do what you have to do and do it right. So for me, my father always used to tell us, be open to the world, read books mm -hmm. about other culture, listen to music. That's why he allowed my brother and allowed us to listen to music. And they also, my mom and dad always used to tell us, a human being is not a matter of color. You do not come back to this house and tell me you fail because you're black, that's when you're gonna see something. Give people the benefits of the doubt, engage in conversation with people. And the house, the, the way our house was built, it was an open forum. Mm. My parents said there would never be any taboo subject at the exception of racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism. Those were not allowed home. And one day I just saw my brother, my father brought, a friend of his brought an album of Jimi Hendrix, and he has that huge afro, right? My brother was born bald, no hair. Nothing wrong with that. Ever. <laughs> I'm talking and looking at your hair. <laughs> but he wanted to have the hair of Jimi Hendrix to play the guitar. Right. So he went ahead and bought the Afro wig and put it on. And I was nine years old. I walked into the room. I saw him and I'm like, did you need a wig to play a guitar? <laughs> 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 and then he goes, I want to look like that guy on the cover. I'm like, by the way, I want to ask you, he's African. What language is he singing in? And my brother said, question, question. I said, answer me. And then he goes, he's African-American, nine years old. I turn around and say, you think I'm stupid because I'm nine years old? How can you be African and American at the center? <laughs> <laughs> and my brother said, well, he's a slave descendant. I said, what is a slave? What is a descendant? Oh, yeah, you hadn't really heard that term. No, you didn't really understand never. that concept. And then he said, you know what? I got to practice my guitar. Go ask grandma. So I went and asked my grandma, my father's mother. You're mom. nine years old, and for the first time, you are trying to figure out what a slave is and what a descendant is and how they come together, together. to come to make Jim, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's exactly the thing. And whether they all have hair like uh, that. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandma started telling me the story of slavery. I'm like, uh, this look like she's losing her mind. I'm like, uh, that's, I mean, out of respect, I didn't tell her you're crazy. But you couldn't conceive <laughs> but, of it. No, because, I, I mean, my father, my mom and said, Dad said, the human being is not a matter of color. I mean, how can that be possible, right? right? And all of a sudden, your grandmother's telling you that, and in I'm fact, like, oh, this whole thing happened. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, you're crazy, man. That's that. Uh, you're old, man. Your brain is fried. Forget it. But I didn't say that, because if I said that, I'd get my butt bitten. <laughs> so I didn't say that. And when I turned 15, we were smuggling to the TV of Nigeria because at that time, being in the TV, you, oh man, forget it. You don't want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So we will be somebody will be on the roof and we go, no, left, right, no, 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 right there, right there, don't move, don't move. So and when it becomes clear, we start watching the news and then here come Winnie Mandela talking about Nelson Mandela. I was 15. And that's what the first time ever I heard about apartheid. And in that living room, I turn around to my mom and dad and say, how dare you lying to me, telling me that I have to give the benefit of the doubt to other people when they are treated like this. And I get so mad. I will never forget how mad I was shaking. I was so mad. And my dad have never seen me like that. And my dad never loses, I mean, his temper, never, because he's always thinking straight. And I went to my room and wrote a song called Azanakwe, which means the day will come. And I came out when I finished writing my song, and I walked into the living room. Everybody was there, and I started singing the song. And my father listened, never stopped me till I finished. And he said to me, I understand how angry you are. I understand every feeling you try to express in this song. But if you don't rewrite this song, you're never going to sing again, because music has nothing to do with hate, and there will never be hate and violence. It was actually a remarkably violent, hateful song. I first swear song. to God, I was just like, yeah. Ah, kill them all. And my father said, no, you ain't killing nobody. <laughs> mm -hmm. You as an artist, you are the person that holds the key to open closed doors. You are the one that have to build bridges, um, bridges among us because music allows you to reach out to people. Music allows you to give people the courage to speak against injustice. You cannot just sit here because you're mad and you blabbing hate all of the places. No way. And that planted the seed of music as being universal. Absolutely. And I went back and rewrite the song. Free of language, free of, Absolutely. you know. And the second thing, I mean, I rewrite the song, and it becomes actually an anthem of peace. The same song. That yes. first song I you I completely wrote. rewrite it. And I said in the song, the, the one that I, I recorded, actually, it becomes a song in which I said, I'm dreaming of a world when, when one day there will be no more oppressor and no more oppressed people that we all live accepting each other's differences of opinion, color, language, and religion. And you, well, I'm just, I mean, I'm just thinking about it for a second. This is, you were talking about your influences with Maryam Makeba, and you were a singer as a woman in Benin, and you said that they, they called you a prostitute. There was no profession of being a female singer a pop singer. A, no, you know, uh, no, no. When you are a traditional singer, you're okay. Right. You have a status. When you start singing with what the old elderly people used to call, and still some of them call them evil instruments, like drum, guitar. Because sex, drug, and rock and roll, don't, don't get it wrong, it came to Africa. That's why rock and roll is not really popular in Africa, mm. because all the parents, they're just like, you, drug and naked women doing this. When you're a boy, the co nobody wants you to date the girl. Mm -hmm. They said, music is not a job. Come on, get out of here, you're, you're a hustler. I mean, it's just like, and till today, it is still impacted some career that we, some beautiful, great voice that we are not able to hear today because there's no support. No, not everybody's like my father that produced right. my first show right. when I went in France, Paris, in the 80s to record my album and the promote, local promoter that was supposed to produce this show said to my father two weeks before the show, poster had been done, everything had been, I cannot produce your child. She's too little. Nobody's going to see her on stage. And my father turned around and said, do you hear your stupid comment? Who told you that talent have anything to do with the size? Or hair. Or oh, hair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I you ask like you, the hair stuff. I do like the hair stuff. <laughs> um, before I move on to, uh, your, your, to Batonga, the foundation, I want to ask you one more thing about music. Uh, Many of your listeners and your fans do not understand the languages in which you speak. About a uh, very small proportion of your songs are in English, yeah. 2%. Yeah. Um, but you don't like the label world music. <laughs> I, I'll take that as no. Who come up with that word? I'm curious myself because I didn't really understand what it meant. I know Miriam, ever. that's how my Miriam put it. One day we were in Bas Basel in Switzerland and after its festival and then when they put us under the banner of world music, she was mad as hell. And Miriam, when she's mad, you don't want to be around. <laughs> she's like, who is the stupid guy that want to call it third world music and somebody told him it's not politically correct to put the third in there. So it just became world music. I mean, who they are to tell us world music? They are playing our music since the End of time. Blues without Africa it doesn't exist. Rock and roll. I'm like, she went, I'm like, you got a point, girlfriend. <laughs> and that is true because here I am being raised in an African country, in a poor family, where 
the world is brought to me through culture. And then I have to justify the music I do when I come to the Western world because people are so stuck up in their cliches saying, you're African, you have to do traditional music, you have to dress like this. And you, have not to, you cannot be articulate, you cannot be educated because we don't, ha we don't have plan for you guys yet. The coffin is not ready for those kind of people already. And here I am and I burst it in and I sing in every language and I, want, I, I even sing in Hindi. I mean, believe it or not, because I love Indian movie, I grew up in it. Yeah, yeah. you too? Dil men chupa ke piare katu fan le chale amach apni matika saman le chale matika saman le chale dil men chupa ke piare katu fan le chale hey <laughs> If I can do it, everybody can. This is officially the best panel <laughs> at, at uh, the World Economic Forum. Are you coming to Bollywood night tomorrow? Yes, yeah, seriously. Yes. <laughs> Let me ask you about, about Batanga, because I want to I get that in, because you are so much more than this, uh, this idol and this, this uh, inspiration to everybody. You have never stopped giving back, and you understand that people like you would not exist if not for the ability for girls to get educated and get respect in Africa. And, and you are dealing with some of the basics, including that bicycle you said that you rode to school with your friend. You're making sure girls get that, but that they get real educations too. Absolutely. At a higher level. Absolutely. Tell me about Batonga. Well, Batonga started in 2006, actually. Because as a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, we camp act campaigns relentlessly for primary education. Because that was not even there. The mm -hmm. right to education is a human right. Yet in Africa, still, we have problem with it. Even though since we started the campaign in 2002 about girls' education, enrollment have went rocket. But now we have quality education that is becoming a problem today. The teacher needs to be up to date. But what we were forgetting that had been reminded to me by a mother in Tanzania was that if the girl finished primary education and you don't put them in secondary education, you give the father all the rights and all the argument he needs to marry those girls off. So she told me that and I start scratching my head, how am I going to do this? With the schedule of an artist, touring all around the world, you cannot do it all. I mean, don't, don't, don't fool yourself. Mm. Not, nobody can do tons of things together and make it right. So I wanted to find people that can support me in this. So a friend of mine had put me in contact with two lawyers out of Washington, Marie Louise Cohen and John Phillips. John Phillips today is the uh, ambassador of the US in, 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 in Italy. They had a fun already, they were doing little things in Africa and I said, they asked me, what do you want to do? I say, I want to invest in secondary education of girls. And I want to target the girls that come from extreme poverty background, HIV, AIDS, orphans, disabled girls, and I want a holistic approach to this. I want not only giving the, the, the tuition, I want to give the uniform, the books, tutoring and mentoring, and one meal a day. Because most of those girls don't have food. So we give them money for them to buy their own food. Because when it comes to food, you have tradition here, you cannot do that, and that's why I'm not into boarding school business, because they want it, because the distance are far. So, we started Batonga in 2006. Tom's have donated more than 300,000 pairs of yeah. shoes to my girls because they walk barefoot to go. That's a, that's a company that's got that's it company right, they understand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, we started this with USAID that came to me the first and said, we have girls in primary education. We are looking for somebody that will start the secondary education. Let's get on board with you. So what we do, basically, is that we follow the program of the, of the country, but the program profit all the kids. I don't want my kids to be in different. I want them to go to school with boys and girls of the country. And the, the, the shoes profit to all other kids also. You don't want to create jealousy. And uh, what we do also is that we work with AfriCare right now to be latrine and water, clean water. So two years ago, I went to one school and the girls were happy that they have the toilet. That's so important. People don't think about it. Sure. Boys and girls in the same school, girls' toilet at that age, in, when you're talking about teenage age, is crucial for them to stay in school or to drop out of school. And they were asking me, 
They were telling me, thank you. I said, yes, this is just the beginning of your job. You gotta make sure that the latrine is clean, that every time you come out, the soap that I provide, you wash your hand and you take, your, you take turn and you take care of it. And they are so proud to do that. And it's also, I give them a second chance. If you, 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 can, you can do a class twice. If you get pregnant and you wanna come back, you can come back. Because you gotta give those girls everything that they need to really go to school because they, the, the, the odds against them are too great. And I met mothers, and mothers, I mean, they are absolutely determined for the girls to go to school. And I asked them, why? They said to me, because no one gave us the chance. If we have had the chance to go to school, we won't become mother at the age of 15. And we don't want that for our daughters. And luckily for me once, I met two fathers that came in. And they were the most skeptical people in the room. They're looking at me like this. I'm like, well, I'm coming to you. And then after a while, I went to them and said, who are you? That you know me, I don't know you. And the first father said, I'm the father of that girl there. I said, the one that smiled all the time? And then he said, yes. My child, I've never seen my child smile and laugh like that since she's, she starts school. Yeah. And I thought that she was going to school to take some drugs. That's why she was so positive when she came <laughs> back home. <laughs> But she was just happy to be in school. And I want to thank you for bringing the smile in the face of my child. And now seeing you and how you treat my kids, I believe in education. I can assure That's you amazing. that I will do the best for other girls to come. And the second one said to me, I have lands I want to donate to Batonga and then we can make a dormitory. I say, I'm not into dormitory business. <laughs> I don't know how to handle that. If you really, really, really want to do that, I can find people that do, does that and, and team up with them and they will but you guys have yeah. to take care of yeah. it. I mean, dormitory is easy to build. Who's taking care of the security of the kids? Who's taking care of, of cleaning up and cooking for them? I, I don't have that means. Well, the mean I have right now, it's barely enough for the program right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Angelique, uh, Africa is a, a, a continent with more than 50 countries and hundreds of languages and many religions and people of many colors, uh, but you really are a hero to all of us who think of ourselves <laughs> as Africans and all of us uh, around the world. We are all world. Africans. Thank you so much for We for are everything all Africans. You're Thank you so much. You're welcome. And congratulations. Thank you. We are. I would like this to go on for another hour and a half, but unfortunately we are limited by our time. Thank you for uh, those of you out there who have joined us for this. And of course this will remain on the web so you can watch it back. For those of you who uh, had the privilege of being here, uh, this is a memento. Uh, of being able to to share this with you. I've interviewed many thousands of people in my life, but rarely have I felt like I've been interviewing a friend so quickly. Thank you so, so much, Thank Ali. you so much. Friend. Thank you, Ali. You look sharp, buddy.